Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and I'm doing a little bit of a first of its kind video, at least on this channel. For me in particular, there are a ton of other content creators that have done content like this, but a lot of you guys wanted to know my opinions and my thoughts on what I expect the meta to look like heading into Worlds here in 2022. We've had two major patches since the end of playoffs in every major region, which means that there has been a significant amount of changes to a significant amount of champions, both buffs, nerfs, all that stuff, everything in between. So I'm going to use this video here to talk about the picks that I expect to see the most. I will be splitting this up essentially into uh, two different parts, but each part kind of has its own subsections. The first part is going to be the big buffs and the big nerfs that have been hit to the champions uh, throughout the last two patches. I'm going to go over what exactly happened to them and whether or not I think it matters or not. I won't be covering every single champion that was buffed or nerfed just because it's two full patches worth and some of them just aren't consequential enough for me to even bring it up. But anything that I think may or may not have any impact on a champion's play rate is going to be mentioned in this video. And then in the second part, we're going to be going through all five of the lanes and I'm going to be going through, in my opinion, the top tier picks that you're going to expect to see out of those lanes at Worlds as well as potentially some tier two picks that could come out as potential counter picks or just potential answers in general. Maybe pocket picks, comfort picks, things like that. So if you guys are excited for this video, let me know down in the comment section below. This is definitely a different video than what I normally post. I'm much more reactionary about some of the teams and, and the records and all that. Usually don't get too much into game, you know, talk game theory. I usually save that for some other channels, but... Figured I'd at least prep you guys for those who only watch my content uh, for what maybe to expect at Worlds this year in. Uh, that, that might be different than what we saw throughout the regular season. So let's go ahead and jump right into the video. I don't want to waste too much time. So let's kick it off with our buffs and nerfs segment here. We're going to start off with the champion buffs that the champions that have been buffed the most, in my opinion, going into Worlds in the last two patches. Of course, the last two patches being 12.17 and 12.18. Those are the two that I will be covering here. Anything 12.16 and before we already knew about because we've been seeing the competitive landscape we played on them in playoffs. But I will be talking about major adjustments. And of course, there's really no other way to start off a buff segment going into Worlds this year than to talk about Maokai, who I think is going to be a pretty huge pick at Worlds this year. And we'll get into that later, but definitely a lot of big buffs for the tank here as... Um, I'll just kind of go through in a, a short sense uh, what exactly they buffed, what happened to them, and then I'll, I'll give a longer version of how exactly I think that affects them. Uh, first of all, I will say this as a general thing for Maokai, pretty much all of his abilities got some sort of buff against large monsters, so against jungle camps, and that could increase the possibility of Maokai jungle coming out at Worlds. I certainly think that there is a chance that he becomes a pretty strong flex pick between three, potentially three lanes. But I'm not exactly sure that jungle is going to be high prio, especially considering the meta that we're going to be getting in the jungle or that I expect to be getting in the jungle. I'm just not sure he's going to be able to keep up with a lot of the people he's going to be playing against here. But kicking it off with Maokai, his passive heal ratio has increased. He's going to be healing a lot more, especially in the early parts of lane phase. Q has increased damage late game. E has no more bonus damage, like direct bonus damage, but it has a significantly higher base damage. And the AP scaling, it scales absolutely ludicrously in a brush now. If you're able to, you know, get that get that sapling down into a brush and have it explode, you're going to be doing a serious amount of damage if you have Demonic Embrace or something like that in laning phase. That could be a huge, huge problem in lane. And I think the big change that everybody sees with Maokai here, the R is now way, way faster. It actually scales in speed and it makes him faster. It gives him movement speed as well. It makes it significantly easier to target that in a team fight to be a little bit more effective rather than just, it, rather than it just being this slow blob coming at you. So overall, what do I think this does for Maokai? I think generally speaking, Maokai is in a really good state right now. And I know, again, they, they really tried to buff jungle Maokai, but to me, he looks like he's going to be a really incredible top laner at this tournament. He has incredible lane control, especially for a tank. He has a really easy matchup into a lot of the other aggressive top laners. I really don't think he has to worry about some of the other champions that were buffed on this patch, like the Jace, something like the Camille that a lot of people are expecting to come back into meta. I really don't see him like struggling in those matchups nearly as hard, and obviously he's always been very good in the tank versus tank matchup. And so I think Maokai might actually have a pretty strong space at Worlds, 
with this buff. He's one of the champions that I think got the most amount of help from these patches, and I certainly think that R could be a complete game changer in team fights. The E doing a ton of damage allows you to have complete control in matchups that you normally would be a little bit more up in the air against, things like the Aatrox, things like the Renekton, because it really shuts off a certain part of that lane, and it allows you to play significantly more aggressive. If they have to play to the lower part of the lane, they're significantly easier to either push in and take advantage of or gank, just in general. And Renekton and Aatrox both don't really appreciate being dove in certain circumstances. And so, overall, I think Maokai is going to be a really good pick here, and I actually think that the buffs are going to help him a lot. The other champion that I think is really, really helped here, is going to get kind of skyrocketed into the meta uh, with some of the buffs on the past patches here, is going to be Hecarim. I think Hecarim obviously was in a state where he was still relatively playable. I think before the buffs, he was a good champion, maybe not a great champion, but a relatively good champion, and now he just simply does more damage, and it's much more efficient for him to do it. His Q is just more damage. They really just added more damage to his Q. He gets more stacks. It has better scaling. The base damage is up. His Q is just better now. Um, the W cooldown is now shorter at early ranks. I think that could theoretically affect his clear in the early game at a high level. I don't think it really has at a solo queue level. Um, but I think at a super high level, it can affect his clear early. Uh, and then the E does less direct damage and does less knockback, but the cooldown significantly shorter. You're going to be able to engage significantly more often on Hecarim now. And overall, I think this is a huge buff for him. I think this is really, really strong for a champion that was already kind of on the fringe of being usable because his impact on the game is always going to be strong. But now he just does it significantly easier, and I think that's going to give him a real opportunity to be one of the more commanding junglers in the meta come Worlds time. Obviously, we've been seeing a pretty stagnant jungle meta throughout the year. A lot of champions in the jungle got relatively nerfed. Some got really nerfed. Things like the Poppy, obviously, I just don't think are going to be nearly as playable. And I think that's absolutely ginormous for a champion like Hecarim. I think if you're looking at the other competition, you know, things like Wukong, things like Trundle, things that have been popular throughout the year that could be super playable at Worlds, I think Hecarim doesn't have a terrible matchup into any of them. A lot of the strengths that they have, he can do as well as long as he has the damage and the mobility to keep up with the rest of them. And so overall, I think this is going to really propel Hecarim into a decent spot in the meta, I'm not sure he's going to be like the top jungler by any means. At least, I'm not sure I would expect that to happen. But if he was one of the top two or three, I certainly wouldn't be all that surprised. And then finally, the the last, I would say, like big change, the big buff, I would say, was, of course, Misfortune in the bottom lane. And MF certainly had uh, some big changes. A lot of them got reverted. We'll talk about that in a bit. You know, the W change basically is entirely reverted. But uh, she still is in a much better spot right now than she was before. Misfortune is still going to be, in my opinion, very scary at Worlds. And I think we're going to be getting a lot more of that spring meta. A lot of people have been talking about that. I'm not as convinced as maybe some other people are. I think there are a lot of really good picks that people are just straight forgetting about right now. But um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later when we talk about the bot lane meta. But for Misfortune in particular, her Q base damage has increased a considerable amount, which is really, really good. That's her best trading tool in the early game. It really allows her to have that early game pressure. Uh, the W had some changes. They got reverted, so uh, I'm not really going to talk about them here because they don't exist anymore. And the E now has a significantly longer cooldown, but the AP ratio and slow are, are significantly more consistent. Again, it's just going to make her lane trading dominance significantly higher. She's going to be a problem in the early game, and you really don't even have to build a ton for her to get there. We're seeing the crit build rise back into prominence, but I wouldn't be surprised to see hybrid builds still be relatively viable, especially with the AP ratio on the E being increased here. I could see that being a big problem for people in the like early mid game here, like 10 minutes or so if she does decide to go something AP, something relatively AP early in the game. However, again, crit build I still think is going to be best on MF. I still expect to see a lot of Kraken, Gale Force in certain matchups, obviously, but I still expect to see a lot of damage coming out from this MF. She's going to be a problem in laning phase to have to deal with very, very similar to what she was in spring, in my opinion. She is going to be a dominant force in the laning phase that is still going to be impactful towards the back half of the game because that ultimate is just always going to be good if you can line it up. And so, especially if you get more consistency with the E here, if the Q damage is going to be higher in the late game, you can get some crits on that Q. Um, it's going to be absolutely absurd, the damage that she's going to be able to put out in the late game. And so, yeah, I, I really would expect her to be one of the top picks, at least for consistency at Worlds. I'm not exactly sure if she's going to give you the same kind of game takeover threat that we've been getting out of some of the bot laners in the, you know, in the meta so far throughout summer. She's not Zeri, she's not Sivir in the late game, but her early game damage is incredibly strong, and she can do a lot in the late game 
It's just not going to be that, like, hyper carry kind of style. The other 80 carries that kind of got buffed here throughout this patch, uh, I'll talk about a little bit shorter here. Those are the three big ones that I wanted to go into pretty heavily, but uh, the three other 80 carries that I think uh, got buffed, and, and it might matter, uh, I guess two and a half 80 carries. Uh, Caitlyn, obviously getting buffed here. More damage on the headshot. The ult does extra damage if you build crit now. I think this is hugely positive, incentivizing the crit build, which is always going to be better for Caitlyn because the auto attacks are a huge part of her damage. As long as lethality is more beneficial, I don't think Caitlyn is ever going to be like the top pick in the meta, and I, I think we're really seeing that right now. Her crit build is doing a lot of damage in solo queue, and I expect her to be a counter to something like Misfortune. We saw that a lot in spring, that Caitlyn can control the lane really, really effectively, and really, the E doesn't matter if you're out of range of it. So, Caitlyn Lux, I expect to see something that is more common at Worlds this year than, than other years. Uh, Kai'Sa also uh, got a, a little bit of a buff. Her AP ratios just generally increased on everything. I don't think it'll matter. Uh, some people are talking about potentially seeing Kai'Sa at Worlds. I don't see it. Uh, I still think she has a lot of problems with a lot of the meta ADCs right now, especially if Misfortune and Caitlyn are going to be back in the meta. I think she has huge problems into both of them. And so overall, while Kai'Sa does get buffs, I'm not sure they're going to matter. Same thing for Ash here. Her Q attack speed got increased. The attack speed she gets on her Q. I'm real. I don't think this matters at all. I think she's basically in the exact same spot that she was before this. Um, really, I think if we're going to see Ash, it's not going to be as an AD carry. It's going to be as a support in this meta with just W max, not even taking Q, uh, you know, the same thing that we've been seeing, Imperial Mandate, whatever, Ash, support. Uh, I, I think that's really her best shot at seeing play at Worlds, and I, I do think it's potentially possible, it's just not something I would predict. I think the Q attack speed is basically, uh, useless, I would say, on Ash at this point, but... There were also some other changes to the top three lanes here. Uh, really no changes to, no buffs, I would say, to any supports that were really all that consequential. So I'll talk about the top laner first here. We'll talk about Jace. Uh, Jace does get a little bit of buffs. Uh, his hammer form, his melee form, his damage was just buffed overall. And I think that could be interesting. A lot of people are really expecting Jace to really pop back into the meta. And I'm not like super sold on that, especially if we're going to be seeing a ton of tanks. Like if Maokai and Orn, and spoiler alert, they're going to be in my tier one. If Maokai and Orn are the two top laners that I'm like most scared of, Jace is not the counter pick that I'm going into with that. Obviously, we'll get into some of the picks that I think could be relatively good into them later, but I don't know. I'm just, I, I'm not sold on the Jace hype train right now. I certainly think that these buffs help him stay relevant, and I definitely think we'll see him at Worlds, but I'm not sure that he's going to be this top tier pick or ban every single game, like top lane defining champion that some people are going to talk about him being. He still does an absolute ton of damage, and he is going to be a problem in the early and the mid game. And in the late game, obviously, he's really versatile. He can team fight. He does a ton with that shockwave, but he can split push incredibly effectively as well. Whatever they really want to do, if he wants to spread the map, that could be an option for Jace as a more neutral pick overall. I just don't see him being the same kind of dominant threat that some of the other top laners in this meta are going to be. Uh, in the jungle, the biggest change, in my opinion, was probably Lee Sin getting a small buff here, uh, better health growth, more life steal. Uh, eh, I don't know. Uh, Lee Sin's still kind of in the same spot to me. The health growth is going to matter. Uh, and I certainly think he's going to be in a better spot overall because of it. If only because it now gives him a role to play in the late game. My biggest problem, if you guys have followed this channel throughout the year, my biggest problem with Lee Sin throughout the year has simply been the fact that after 15 minutes, he really is just a kick. He doesn't offer any damage. He's not really tanky enough to justify going full tank on him. There really isn't a ton that you get out of Lee Sim if you don't get that ginormous early game lead. Obviously, the kick is still going to be influential, but honestly, it's more up to the ADC at that point if they're going to be out of position and get hit by the kick than it would be, you know, Lee Sin landing a sick play. Uh, usually, you can avoid Lee Sin kicks at a high level, especially at Worlds. I can see that being much more of a problem, but I do think the health growth and the lifesteal matter to him. It allows him to be significantly more tanky in the late game, which I do think is going to matter. It gives him some sort of role to play towards the back half. If he can be an engager that can go in, perhaps get a kick on the, you know, we've seen this uh, throughout the LPL playoffs. We saw more of an adaptation towards kicking the frontliner just out of the team fight. That way your midliners have an easier chance of getting to the other midliners and being able to create that fight. We could be seeing more of that. Or of course, if you can land it on the back line, He's just got more survivability to be able to do stuff after you land that kick. And I think that's always going to be beneficial for Lee Sin. And when Lee Sin is relatively meta, people are going to bring him out. He's been being played all year long, and I don't even think he's been all that good. And so any buffs to Lee Sin, I think at this point, are probably going to put him back in the meta. And then in the mid lane, the only real one that I want to talk about here is Twisted Fate. He gets more damage on the Q. His E costs less mana. 
I don't think this will matter. Obviously, the meta is exactly the same as it has been throughout the entire year in the mid lane. We're still going to be seeing a lot of shove and roam opportunities. TF is very good for that, but his damage and his consistency just hasn't been there in comparison to a lot of the other top mid laners. I'm not exactly sure that changes, but there is a world in which I can see TF kind of popping up at Worlds, potentially doing some things. I do think this helps him overall, especially with the pushing in the early game. And if he's able to get on the map, move around a little bit quicker, even without ultimate, I think that could be a huge positive for him. But those are kind of the main buffs that I want to talk about here. Um, if there's any that I left out that you guys want to discuss down in the comment section below, feel free to leave them there. Always love chatting up with you guys, but uh, now it's time to move on to the nerfs. And the nerfs are certainly there. Some are big, most are small. Um, there's really not a lot of like actual game breaking or champion breaking nerfs. There's only a few. Uh, and so we're going to start off with the ones that do matter in my opinion. And the big champion nerfs in my opinion that do matter are going to be first for Zeri. Zeri I think is in a much worse spot right now. Uh, her Q was decreased, her damage just significantly decreased, and uh, her W was basically gutted. The AD ratio on her W was completely taken away, and um, I don't think that that's all that good for Zeri. Um, she's really already kind of been a little bit pushed lower than she was in the regular season in the playoffs. We saw multiple teams moving away, I would say, from the Zeri pick, mostly because teams realized that if they just like got on top of her, she couldn't do anything about it, and so... Uh, even though that W was still incredibly annoying, now that that's gone and the Q damage is lower, she really is just kind of annoying for no damage now. And I could definitely see that being a problem. However, the things that made Zeri, like Zeri at the very least, her, her survivability, her movement speed, all that stuff, those have not been touched. Uh, she still is incredibly difficult to actually deal with and to actually get on top of. She's just not doing nearly as much when she isn't you know, being dove at this point. And so the Q is not doing as much. The W is not doing as much. I can see this being a problem for Zeri. I could see her really dropping in priority. And in fact, I certainly would expect that. There were a lot of really good AD carries in the meta right now that can do a lot both early and late game. And I really think especially gutting the W, which was Zeri's biggest calling card, was the fact that she could half health your entire team from 700 miles away. Uh, I think that's going to be a problem for her. I, I think she is going to be significantly less useful than she would have been. Do I think she's going to be bad? No, I certainly think she's still pickable. A lot of the things she did well, I think she still is capable of doing well. She's just not going to do them at the same kind of damage level that she was able to do so consistently before. And so Zeri definitely hit. The other champion that I think was hit pretty hard that will probably feel it is Azir, in my opinion. I think Azir, I'm really surprised, first of all, to see Azir nerfs coming in right before Worlds. This is like the opposite of what Riot typically does. Azir is a champion that they have consistently tried to make viable on the World stage. Maybe this is the year they finally say no more Azir at Worlds, but they do go ahead and nerf him. I don't know if it's going to be absolutely huge enough to take him out of the meta, but I think it certainly is enough to take him out of like the tier one of mid laners. The AP scaling on the W definitely decreased. The soldiers have a much longer refresh time and they do less damage. That's a problem. That's all of Azir's damage in the mid to late game. The E now has a significantly increased cooldown as well as survivability. His consistent, I would say, survivability in teamfights has now gone down in that same vein. I can see Azir just being a less reliable pick right now. We already saw people kind of moving away from the damage-oriented mid laners in general, especially in the LPL and the LCK. Azir was really the only one that was hanging on for dear life. Uh, and even when teams were doing it, a lot of times they were going to the more control mage style to offer that supportive ideology while still being able to do damage towards the back half of the game. Azir doesn't offer you anything other than damage. And so if he's not doing the same kind of damage that he was doing, I can see that being a pretty big problem. Now, I'm no mid lane expert. And so um, Azir could still have some pretty good matchups into a lot of the good mid laners in the meta right now. But his, his survivability is still good. His, his mobility is still bad. He's basically still the champion just with significantly less damage. It's still up to, I think, the team to determine whether or not the risk versus reward of using Azir in a circumstance like that is still worth it. We're still going to be seeing a lot of Talia. We're still going to be seeing a lot of Silas, even though Silas got some nerfs. It's really, like, the meta's not going to be changing all that much. And Azir already kind of had his pluses and minuses, and now the pluses are just a little bit, you know, dampened. And so... Overall, I would expect Azir to definitely fall off. Zeri and Azir, I definitely think, are the two champions that were probably 
uh, hit hardest by the two patch uh, nerfs here. But there were some other champions that I do think were hit. A lot of people are going to bring up Sivir here. And I understand that a lot of people think that Sivir is now, like, not good. I certainly disagree with that. The changes that were made to Sivir, the AD growth, her just general AD growth was nerfed. She's going to be doing less general damage. And the W AD ratio was nerfed. And so... She's going to do less damage consistently in team fights, but she's still going to be doing a lot of damage. And even the nerfs weren't like crazy, crazy nerfs. I still think she has a role in the game as this champion that really power spikes hard after three items. She still does that even with decreased ratios. The Q is still hurts. It still really, really hurts. And the movement speed that she offers the entire team in team fights with that ultimate is still going to be good, even if she isn't doing ridiculous amounts of damage. As long as she's doing very, very good amounts of damage, like if she can keep up with Kaisa and Caitlyn and MF in terms of damage in the late game, then she's probably still worth it. And she probably is still out damaging all of them, even with all that. And so overall, I, I think it definitely is a nerf to Sivir. I don't think she's necessarily the top tier AD carry in the meta right now, but I see a lot of people saying that Zeri and Sivir just aren't going to be playable at Worlds. And while for Zeri, I can understand that a tad bit, even if I don't agree with it, I really don't understand that for Sivir. I still think she is going to be significantly viable at the World Championships, and is certainly going to be matchup dependent, but she still scales incredibly well. The spell shield will always, always be useful. The ult will always be useful, and so there's a lot of tools for her to actively help out the rest of her team, you know, give herself survivability, and it's not like she still doesn't do damage. It's just not going to be to the same level that she's been doing it all year, so... Sivir nerfed, but I'm not sure it's going to matter. Uh, Nami also got a nerf here. Um... Just her interaction on her E got nerfed, quote-unquote. This is to help stop the Lucian Nami lane from being as oppressive. A Nami no longer procs both Electrocute and Phase Rush. They don't count as separate instances uh, when she does her E, and so that's a good thing. Overall, that was a little bit of a broken interaction. That feels more like a bug fix than it does like a nerf in any way, but they don't count it as a bug fix, so I'm not going to talk about it. But <laughs> a lot of the things that Lucian Nami still do really well, they still do really well. They're still going to be one of the highest damage bot lanes in the game. And there's still going to be a lot of opportunities for those two champions to be able to take advantage of some of the other maybe less aggressive early game picks. Now, if you're going into a lot of Caitlyn, if you're going into a lot of MF, I could see Lucian Nami definitely falling in Pryo. I don't think they have the same kind of early game pressure that they used to against those champions. And so I can see that being an issue. But if... If the meta goes a little bit more how I expect, where it's going to go one way or the other, um, wh where we go more to these late-game hyper carries that just kind of were on the second tier because of Zeri and Sivir over the course of the year, things like Aphelios, things like Jinx, that really are strong in the meta, I still think Lucian has a place in the meta. And I know I'm talking about Lucian when Nami got the nerf, but that's really what this nerf was about, was the Lucian-Nami lane rather than just Nami. I still think they have their place against picks like Aphelios, against picks like Jinx, where I do think they can take advantage of a lot of the weaknesses. If Kai'Sa comes back into the meta, I think Lucian Nami still really heavily beats Kai'Sa. And so overall, does the nerf matter? Kind of, but does it really, really matter? Probably not. I think a lot of the instances where teams would pick Lucian Nami, I don't think this deters them heavily. I do think that this is a nerf and they're not going to be as effective, right? But I don't think this will really change their usage rate at all. I think it really just comes down to more... They're, they're not as blind pickable anymore. I think it's more matchup knowledge. If you're going to go into an early game uh, focus AD carry, an early game focus bot lane, you just don't have that same kind of punching power that you could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them early in the games like you used to, but you still have a ton of extra damage in that lane if you're going into somebody who maybe isn't going to be as... Uh, active in the early game against something like an Aphelio, something like a Jinx, maybe even a Twitch, like things like that that I think could be seen at Worlds. And so overall, I think the bot lane's still in a pretty good spot, even with the Nami nerf. Uh, Lulu also got nerfed. Again, uh, this matters, but like how much is something that we're going to have to see. Really, what this does for me, Lulu, uh, by the way, her W just got nerfed in every facet of it. Uh, basically everything. The movement speed, the polymorph, the cooldown, all of it was nerfed. So it was just a, a, a direct nerf to her polymorph, to her W, and that's good. I mean, Lulu's needed it for a while, but she's still going to be incredibly annoying and incredibly oppressive to play into in lane. She's still going to poke. She's still going to be a huge problem. She's just not going to be as inherently annoying in the late game, which I do think is a good thing overall. What does this do for the support meta? And we'll get to Yumi in a bit. Yumi also got a very small nerf. And honestly, kind of a, a she got a nerf and a buff to compensate for how big her nerf was, quote unquote. Uh, but Lulu and Yumi, I think, are still going to be incredibly viable. I think it just opens the door for more enchanters to be viable. And I've been talking about this all year. Lulu and Yumi have definitely dominated the meta because they've been the two clear-cut best enchanters in the meta right now. But 
Picks like Janna, picks like Soraka might come into more viability here. They just might be on a closer, even playing field now, is I guess what I'm trying to say now that Lulu and Yumi have been taken down. Maybe, like, a step. Even if it's not a huge step, I definitely think they're still viable, but this may just even the playing field a tad bit more with maybe some of the other enchanters that were kind of hanging on for dear life throughout the year. So we'll get to Yumi now. Uh, we might as well talk about her since we're talking about Lulu. Uh, Yumi had her heal cooldown increased and the bonus movement speed nerfed off of her W. It was a big nerf, I think, to the W, and they realized that maybe it was a little too much, so they hotfixed some Q damage increases, and her uh, her ultimate has a cooldown buff as well. So a, a nerf that was pretty heavy towards the champion, but uh, some buffs to kind of even that out. It just makes her more annoying to play against in laning phase, in my opinion. Yes, her movement speed is a problem, and obviously the heal cooldown is good. Like, it's good to increase that. That's the main part of why you pick Yumi in the first place, but... She does so much other than just heal. Like, it's not just that that becomes the problem. Uh, and now if she's going to be doing, like, actual major poke level uh, damage in the bottom lane, that's a problem. And the ultimate cooldown being buffed is pretty huge for Yumi. It allows her to make plays across the map, I think, a little bit more efficiently now while still allowing her AD carry to be safe. And so, I don't know. Honestly, I still think she's going to be the best support in the meta. I really don't think that's going to change all that much. Uh, overall, Yumi and Lulu are still looking pretty good. They're just not looking as, like, dominant. Like, this, they're this much better than everybody else. I still think they're going to be some of the best supports in the meta. I just don't know if they're going to be, like, SS, triple S, plus tier every single game like they were throughout most of the split. But we also have some jungle changes here. We've got Poppy and Wukong both receiving nerfs. Uh, definitely to differing degrees. We'll talk about Wukong first because his, I don't think, matter nearly as much. He got his base movement speed reduced. He got his base attack speed reduced. That's going to be a problem, I think, for early clear. Obviously, he's not going to be nearly as efficient early, but overall, I really don't think this impacts the champion all that much. Unless team comps change drastically going into worlds, unless we're not seeing enchanters out of the support position, and if we see more engagers, or if we're seeing a more mid lane oriented meta where Wukong can't just get a lot of resources and roam a lot with the, with, you know, make 2v2 plays with the mid lane, I really don't see Wukong's playstyle changing all that much. He might not be able to clear as fast now, but. That's really it, right? Like, the movement speed's a little bit of a problem, the attack speed's a little bit of a problem early, but by the time you get two items, like, none of that really matters all that much, and so, overall, I still think Wukong is going to be one of the best junglers in the meta, as long as the meta around him sticks in the same spot. And Poppy, you know, to a lesser extent, I think, will be viable, but I actually do think her nerf is probably a little bit bigger. She had her Q damage uh, basically cut against monsters by a ton, by basically 20 per which is not good for Poppy. Uh, her clear is now actually not all that efficient. I actually tried playing this the other day. It really didn't feel all that good. Um, and so, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to see Poppy or not. She still does a lot of the things in the late game that everybody likes. She's still incredibly tanky. The ultimate's really good. The W is still phenomenal. You still have so many dashes in the meta that having Poppy there to be able to stop that is still absolutely ginormous for ganks, for everything like that. But... She's just significantly less efficient in the early game, and we already saw teams start to prioritize Poppy less in the playoffs because she was starting to get out jungled by things like, you know, people started learning how to jungle against her with things like Trendle and Wukong in the early game. Now you add Hecarim to that mix. I'm just not super sold that Poppy is going to be as efficient of a pick that she was, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. But I certainly think she's playable. A lot of the, again, like I said, a lot of the things she does in the late game, I still think are good. It's just the clear that has become significantly more difficult for Poppy. I don't think she's going to be able to trade nearly as effectively in the early game because I think it's going to take her longer to get to the places she needs to get to. And uh, overall, I definitely think that is a nerf to Poppy overall. So I think she'll be in the meta, but certainly not to the level that she was throughout most of summer. And then finally, there's Callista. Uh, a lot of people are talking about this base health nerf to Callista. It'll matter, but it won't matter too much. Calista still does a lot of the things that you want her to do. Her trading is significantly more risky now, but it's still very, very possible, especially with a lot of the supports that are going to be coming into meta. I still think Calista is going to be one of the top picks in the game. But those are the buffs and the nerfs. Let me know down below if you think I'm overestimating, underestimating any of the buffs, any of the nerfs. I know we all have different opinions on the meta that we're going to be getting these are my opinions on some of the buffs and nerfs that we're going to be getting going into it, but now it is time to talk about where I think all of the positions are going to land going into Worlds. All right, so we're going to be going lane by lane now, talking about all five lanes from top down to support, talking about the champions that I expect to see most often in these roles. We're going to be splitting everything up into two tiers. Tier 1 in every lane is going to be the champions that I expect to be the staples, the focal points of the meta. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less per role. 
Uh, some champions are just stronger than others right now. Some lanes have more parity than others. We'll talk about that when we get to them. And then there's going to be a tier two. These are picks that I think are relatively viable, but aren't things that I would expect to see super heavily prioritized. They could be good counter picks. They could be good team synergy picks, things that I would expect to see a couple of times at Worlds, but maybe not something that the meta is going to shift around. But we'll be going lane by lane here, of course, starting with the top lane and kicking it off with our top lane tier one meta. I've actually got six champions. This is by far the biggest tier one. I actually think it's tied for the biggest tier one, but we'll get to that. Uh, the tier one champions in the top lane to me are going to be Maokai, Orn, Gwen, Nar, Aatrox, and Renekton. A lot of people are going to say no Jace, no Camille, no aggressive picks. Yes, I've been talking about this on the channel for a while. I think we're going to get a more passive version of what we've been getting out of the top lane matchup for a lot of this year. I think instead of Sejuani, we're going to be seeing a lot of Maokai. I think he does a lot of the things that Sedge wants to do, but he just does them more efficiently. And I think tanks are going to be a big thing to actually have to beat. I think Maokai and Orn, in my opinion, are a tier above pretty much everybody else in the, in terms of just power level right now. I think they're going to be the two that dominate the meta, if I had to predict. And then you also have Gwen, and, and Gwen's always going to be up there in that top three, right? If you have two tanks in the top three, Gwen is always going to be played just for how good of a matchup she generally has into tanks, and I think she does really well in Orn. I think she can do really well in Maokai. If there is any more quote-unquote aggressive bruiser pick to, that I think is going to be played in the top lane, I think Gwen is probably the most likely out of them, but Maokai and Orn, in my opinion, are probably the two champions that are going to dominate the top lane meta the most, if I had to predict. Um, I, I expect that matchup a lot, by the way. Uh, I already talked a bit about why, but uh, again, Maokai can control the lane so efficiently, and Orn does the very same thing. It's just very difficult to generate leads against them, and Really, there's nobody else in the top lane that has the same kind of late game pressure that those two are going to have with Maokai's increased ultimate, with Orn's ultimate just in general and him being able to give free stats to your team. Really, if they're not being able to be punished early, they're going to outscale you and they're going to become a problem in the late game. And so overall, I would just expect these two to be the most safe options that a lot of teams end up going towards. Now, they're not carry oriented options. That's where you can see things like the Gwen. Things like the Renekton that I think are still going to be relatively viable. I don't think Renekton's all that strong, but teams are going to value him at Tier 1 because that's just what they do. I think Aatrox, I think Gnar are in a very similar boat to that as well. They are picks that I think are going to come out relatively consistently. Gnar because he is relatively good into the tanks. He's just not nearly as efficient in the late game as I think Maokai and Orn are going to be. But his lane matchup I think is significantly easier into them than a lot of the more aggressive quote-unquote picks in the top lane. And then for Aatrox, he actually just kind of has the opposite. While his lane matchup isn't particularly good into Maokai or Orn, especially if Maokai can set up a lot in the top lane, gets pressure early, it could be a really big problem for Aatrox. I think overall, Aatrox does have a lot of efficiency in the late game. He is able to create a lot of pressure that maybe Orn and Maokai can't deal with because he can actually get in behind them with flanks and create that second wall that I always talk about with Aatrox and Renekton overall. And so I would expect these six to kind of be the big, big top laners in the meta. Although I do think that there is some room for open, you know, talk here. Uh, and that's where we get into our tier two picks for top lane. Now, there are six more champions that I could talk about here. Uh, there's a bunch more that I think I could mention. But the six that I'm going to talk about as the tier two, like options, I've got Jace, Camille, Gangplank, Jax, Fiora, and Kennen. These are the picks that I think we've seen pretty consistently throughout the year be positive and Overall, I think that all of them have a little bit of a niche. Jace, obviously, the most common because of his buffs. I do think he has relatively he has a relatively strong early game. I'm just not sure how efficient that early game will be into the combination of tanks that we're going to be seeing a lot of. Now, if we're seeing more Renekton, if we're seeing more Nar, if we're seeing more Aatrox, I actually think Jace has a pretty good matchup into them, and he could be a really good counter pick in certain situations. I just don't know if I would consider him a top tier uh, champion in the meta right now when he doesn't really have all that good of a matchup against what are, in my opinion, the top two champions in top lane. Same thing for Camille. Again, I think she can do a lot. Very versatile as a pick. Uh, I, I, you always see Camille around World's 10 because she can do so much and she allows you to do so much. She's not the damage that she used to be, but she can still do a lot. She can split push. She can team fight. Whatever you need her to do, she's going to be there. Gangplank in a similar boat, but really, I, I think we're going to see a lot of Gangplank, uh, mostly just because I think a lot of players at Worlds this year are very comfortable on Gangplank. There are a lot of players going to this tournament that I think are going to be pulling that out. Jax, Fiora, Kennen, all on here for similar but different reasons. Jax and Fiora, we've seen throughout the year, have been the main, like, meta-breaking split pushers, if you want to call them that. If you really want your top lane to be on an island, to be able to separate themselves and be able to generate their own lead, Jax and Fiora have pretty commonly been the pick, depending on the region. Uh, and I also think they're pretty good into each other. I think, really, at that time, in my opinion, it's, it's kind of a skill matchup. I do think that Jax can relatively win that consistently, but... 
Uh, I do think it's it's a skill matchup overall, and uh, if you're going to see any, like, heavy split pushers, anybody that's going to be trying to pull attention away from the 5v5 team fights, which is where I think a lot of the meta is more shifting towards, I think Jax and Fiora are going to be that. And alternatively, if you want to invest super heavily into those 5v5 team fights, you could go for the cannon. We've been seeing that out of a lot of players throughout the world as well, and so I wouldn't be all that surprised to see that come out at Worlds, especially that cannon nocturne combo that we saw um, LNG really popularized, Doan be really popularized. Not sure if we're going to see a ton of that at Worlds, but it definitely still is an option. So, overall, those are the top lane champions I expect to see. I most expect this to be a tank-oriented meta, but I do think there are definitely some more aggressive picks that could come out as counter picks, and especially if you're sitting there on, like, red side, I think top lane could be a very, very good role to save counter pick for. Mid lane right now, maybe not in that same kind of spot. I really don't think jungle needs it either. ADC and support definitely don't, and so top lane I expect to see kind of the counter pick role for the most part on red side, and that could be very good for a lot of the champions that sit here in tier 2. I think this meta in top lane is probably going to be the most volatile of any of the roles. Moving on now to our second role, which is going to be the jungle here in this video, and I've only got four junglers in tier one here, as I really do think that there's a pretty big gap between these four and the rest in terms of what to expect at Worlds. I don't necessarily think these are the four strongest junglers in the meta right now, but these are certainly the four that I would expect to see the most. I think headlined, of course, by Wukong and Trundle. They've been in the meta all year long. Both did receive nerfs in the past two patches, but neither, I think, is going to be all that consequential, especially for their playstyle. Uh, Wukong, we talked about. Trundle, I didn't even bring up in the nerf section because I really just don't think it's going to matter at all for him. I think he does exactly what he used to, and it's really not going to be a problem, especially if we're going to a more top lane tank-oriented meta. Trundle's priority, I think, is only going to skyrocket. He becomes a huge problem in team fights if he can just steal Maokai, you know, resistances, or if he can just steal Orn resistances. And so, I think Trundle value is going to be at an all-time high. I honestly would expect Trundle to probably be the number one jungler at Worlds, although I definitely think both Wukong and Hecarim could definitely fight him for that. Wukong, I definitely think, like I said in the nerf section, is probably still in the exact same spot that he was in just a couple of weeks ago. He's still going to be an early game focused jungler that can trade early, that can create pressure in lanes, and is really, really difficult to stop if he can snowball the game out of control towards the mid to late game. He just has so much pressure that he can create on the map. He's so safe with the W, and he does so much damage. With the Q, the ultimate is always, always, always good, especially in a meta where team fighting is absolutely ginormous. Wukong is a genuinely phenomenal team fighter. I really just don't see his priority going down all that much. Uh, Hecarim, with the buffs, I think is going to jump into that tier 1 of the jungle meta. I certainly think he is going to be super playable. We know there are a lot of players at Worlds that are very, very good on the Hecarim. Uh, I expect him to be pulled out as a more aggressive counter pick to something like the Wukong or the Trundle, because I do think his early game pressure can you know, maybe outpace some of them, especially with the gank pressure that was added in a lot of his buffs. I think he could create a lot of dominance on the map if he were played correctly. In a meta where it feels like jungle is incredibly important to snowball out of control, it very much feels like the most important role in the game right now. I think Hecarim is a very, very good champion for being able to snowball that jungle. If you get a couple of early kills on Hecarim, if you're able to control the objectives, I really do think that Hecarim is an incredibly difficult champion to deal with. And so he could very, very quickly, in my opinion, become the number one jungler in this meta if we see him dominating the early game like he can. And then there's, of course, Lee Sin. I talked about this. Snowballing is very important in the jungle. And even if Lee Sin isn't all that efficient towards the back half of the game, he still creates so much panic in the early game. And he does so much for his laners that if he can get his team in a position to just win the game, it's often very difficult for the enemy team to come back. So even if he's not all that useful after like 20-ish minutes, I still think he is going to be one of the top picks. Again, people are super comfortable on him. I do think that the health growth is going to matter for him. It just allows him to be significantly more useful in the late game, just purely as a sponge for damage. Uh, and if he can get on the back line, that's always going to be huge. It just gives him more opportunities, I think, to do the things that he wants to do. And so overall, I think these are the four top tier, the tier one jungles. But I do think that there are quite a few junglers that sit in tier two. For me, I only put four here, but there are going to be quite a few more that I think have the opportunity to break into this tier. The four that I put are Xin Zhao, Vi, Jarvan, and Nocturne. 
Uh, these four picks we've seen pretty consistently throughout the year, and they really haven't been changed all that much. Xinxiao, I think, offers you a really, really early game presence if you really want to dominate in that early game. The problem with Xinxiao is if he loses, he offers you absolutely nothing towards the back half of the game. That's the reason he's sitting here in Tier 2 and not Tier 1. I do think his early game pressure and his gank pressure is absolutely ginormous. I just don't know if he's going to be as efficient as a lot of the other top 3, top 4 junglers that we're going to be seeing in the meta right now. Vi, in a similar stance, was really, really popular throughout summer as a counter pick to Zeri because you're able to just point and click on her and be able to target her in the back half of team fights. Now, with Zeri definitely probably dropping in prio in the meta, I'm not sure she's going to be nearly as effective. But point and click CC is still really, really good. We could still see Vi coming out and being relatively effective. Uh, I just don't really see a lot of use for her overall with Zeri out of the meta. Uh, you've got Jarvan here as well. We've actually been seeing Jarvan rise in popularity over the past few weeks. He's the exact same champion that he was in playoffs. He is an incredibly good initiator that is incredibly squishy if you're not ahead. And so uh, it could be good, could be bad. It's a very momentum-oriented pick. We see players like Maorang obviously being able to dominate on it. But I definitely think it's going to be Jarvan doing his thing, being the champion that we've known he's been throughout playoffs. Uh, if he's able to snowball the game, he's going to be able to win a lot of matchups. If he's not able to snowball the game, he's really not going to be all that useful towards the back half of the game because he's going to cataclysm in and then immediately die. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, Jarvan is what he is. He's probably not going to be picked by everybody. He's going to be more of a pocket pick, counter pick kind of jungler, but he definitely still is there. And then speaking of pocket pick, counter pick, I put Nocturne on this slide purely for the combo that we saw out of the LPL, the Nocturne Kennen. Nocturne, again, is someone that I think we could be seeing flexed into multiple roles. We could be seeing Nocturne top lane. We could be seeing Nocturne mid lane. I definitely think those options are still on the table, but he gets the spot in the jungle here because I think that's probably most likely where we see him. Again, he does the same thing. He turns out the lights and he can do a lot of damage to a backliner. The efficiency of him being able to do that is probably higher than what Vi gives you at this point. And so I think he probably takes over that role for Vi. The spell shield's really big. And honestly, just the ultimate in general, being able to turn off the lights for the entire enemy team can be absolutely ginormous if you have the cannon flank or whatever you want to pair with it. I think it can be really, really good. And so I would expect Nocturne Prio to, you know, honestly rise, uh, kind of taking over that spot for what Vi was in the regular season. But these are certainly not the extent of all the junglers that I think could be relevant. You know, things like Poppy, I think could definitely still be in the meta and not be all that crazy to be pulled out here. Uh, Maokai even could probably be flexed into your, in here to the jungle. Like I said, got a bunch of buffs there. But overall, I would expect these eight to probably be the eight that are the most common over the course of the tournament. Could we see more? Absolutely. But these are the eight that I think I'm most expecting. And with jungle being probably the biggest role in the meta right now, these eight are going to have a lot of responsibility on them to be able to snowball the game for their team. Moving on to the lane that I think was impacted the least by a lot of the changes that were taking place over the past few patches, it's time to move on to our mid lane here. And mid lane's got the smallest tier one, and it's had the smallest tier one all year long. I think the same three champions that have been dominant throughout the year are probably still going to be dominant at Worlds here. And the top three for me, Talia, Ari, Silas, I think they've basically stuck. Now, yes, Silas did receive a few nerfs, but I think what that really does is just take him from, you know, easily the best mid lane champion in the game to one of the top three mid lane champions in the game. I don't think it's going to impact him all too much. Talia and Ari are basically untouched over the past few patches. I think all of them do the exact same things that they've been doing all year long, and I really would be surprised to see the mid lane meta change all that much. It still really is about shoving the mid lane, being able to roam with your jungler, be able to create plays around objectives or push bot lane or whatever you really want to do, dive, dive bot, whatever, invade, Whatever you need to do to snowball your jungler out of control and then being useful in the late game, which Talia, Ari, and Silas just do the best job of. Talia, in my opinion, has become the clear-cut number one mid laner in the game right now. Her damage is actually absurd. You can even invest into her, I think, more so than you can invest in the other two. Silas definitely used to have that spot, but with the nerfs, I think it's just a little bit more consistent with Tilia right now. Uh, I think her ability to be able to be anywhere on the map with the ultimate at any time, while being able to shove wave basically faster than anybody, and honestly, her damage is nuts. She's able to stop dashes. She does a lot of what, you know, uh, can be considered counter meta, and her Q damage hurts. If you hit the, the seismic shove, you're in a really good spot. Like, you can cut off, you know, certain choke points. Talia's versatility, I think, just offers you more than almost anybody in the game can give you right now. And so for me, Talia is pretty much the clear-cut number one mid laner in the game right now. We saw teams kind of move away from her in playoffs, and I really just don't understand that. I really hope teams figure out that Talia is just really, really good right now. 
Uh, and then you have Ari and Silas. I think they do very similar things. Both are more assassin oriented, but both do it in different ways. Ari definitely more damage oriented. Wants to be able to, you know, collapse into the bot lane on a on a 4v3 or whatever as the final member and be able to clean up a lot of kills. Is able to shove the wave, the wave relatively quickly. Has an incredibly difficult time being caught. Is really, 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 really mobile and just creates a lot of pressure for the enemy team. You really have to be cautious and have vision around mid lane because she could be anywhere at any point and if you're hit with charm and anybody else is around you're probably just going to die and then you have Silas, who's kind of the opposite of that. Still is more of that assassin. If you walk into him, you're going to die. But it's much more of a frontline drain tank towards the back half of the games. And I still think that's going to be just as effective. I really don't think that Silas is going to be any less effective than he was over the past few weeks. I just think he's maybe going to have a little bit worse of a time in the early game. And, and that's really all... That was the only difference that he had into Talia before that he has, that he doesn't really have now. Is I just don't know if he's going to be as efficient early. But these three are, in my opinion, are very, very clearly the top three in the meta right now. So... That leaves us with the smallest tier 1 of any of the groups, but the biggest tier 2, as I think a lot of champions in the mid lane are going to be relatively playable, as you can see here with tier 2. I've got Azir, Lissandra, Akali, Swain, Oriana, Victor, and LeBlanc listed. There are plenty more that theoretically could be pulled out here. Anivia was almost close to making this list. I already talked about something like a Nocturne potentially being flexed here. There are options. Yone I didn't even bring up. Like, that is certainly an option. There are, there are plenty of champions that I think we could see at the mid lane. Uh, in, in the mid lane here, I just don't think any of them are going to give you the same kind of power and push level that the top three are. So I'll quickly try to talk about these seven um, and, and, and maybe get into some of the other ones. But we talked about Azir in the nerf section. I actually do think he was hit relatively hard. He was probably in the tier one throughout most of playoffs, but he drops down to tier two for me. Players are just so good at him now, and they're so practice on Azir that I would be entirely shocked if he was taken out of the meta for Worlds. There are going to be a ton of players that I think just want to play Azir, and I don't really see that changing, even if he isn't doing nearly as much damage, and even if he isn't nearly as efficient. I still think there's going to be a lot of players that are going to go to that champion just purely because they've spent so much time on him. Then you have picks like Lissandra uh, that I think are really more counter picks to uh, Ari, to Silas, things like that. Even to Talia, I think Lissandra has a pretty good matchup. Lissandra also does great into Akali, does great into LeBlanc. And so really your assassin quote unquote counter pick here in Lissandra. Uh, I, I think she will be pulled out as a counter pick just like she was all year long. She doesn't really have a much of damage, but she can shove the wave and she is relatively mobile with her E. So she can create plays. She does kind of fit the team fight meta. I just don't think she does it nearly as well as a lot of the other champions that she's going to be playing into. But she does a very good job at shutting down one particular target. And if that's something that you really need in your comp, I could definitely see Lissandra still being pulled out. If you need damage, Akali, LeBlanc, definitely still on the board as assassin options. I've been a little bit lower on both of them throughout the year. I think Akali is actually in a pretty good spot right now in terms of balance. She is able to kill people, but it's not super free. It isn't you know, I'm going to kill someone and get out, and there's really nothing anybody can do about that if I play right. Um, she's not that Akali anymore, which I think is good, but she definitely still has the opportunity to kill people and snowball the game here. You can still do a lot on Akali, just generally, as a champion, and so uh, I, I still think she's probably your, your tier 2 assassin of choice, but players have been going to LeBlanc. Obviously, people are very experienced on LeBlanc. I just don't think her damage is all that much right now. She still is incredibly difficult to catch, and it's honestly very, very difficult to lock her down, but her damage is not really that high. And honestly, that's kind of what I want out of LeBlanc right now. If I'm choosing between Akali and LeBlanc, Akali has significantly more kill potential, and therefore, I think Akali is probably what I'd lean towards. But again, I understand the safety of wanting to go for something like LeBlanc, where you're really never going to be in that much danger. Uh, and then you have your more mage-oriented tier 2 picks. Things like the Swain, the Oriana, the Victor. We've seen multiple teams be able to pull these out. Swain, I definitely think, is an underrated pick in the meta right now. I think he can dominate a lot of mid lane matchups. He's not super good early, but if he can get to that late game in a teamfight meta where he can just turn on his ult, stand there, and do a ton of damage, he's really, really difficult to deal with if he has any sort of gold. And so, yeah, I don't know if teams are actually going to go to him, but uh, he is a good pick in my opinion. And then Ori and Victor, if you do want to go to control mages, I don't think they're all that good right now, but... These are clearly, in my opinion, the two best control mages in the meta. Oriana, for that more supportive style, really isn't going to offer you any damage, but the shield, the shockwave, always going to be useful. We've seen Cloud9 very much make use of that Oriana pick to be able to make plays around the map. And then Victor, I think if you want a control mage that is a bit more of a damage threat towards the back half of the game, he's probably your choice there. But like I said, Anivia, Yone, Nocturne, even something like a Zillion, like these are all relatively decent picks in the mid lane. I think the meta is really going to revolve around those top three of Talia, Silas, and Ari, 
but there are so many things that I think could be picked as counters to those, or if they're banned out or if they're not in the game, I think the mid lane meta opens up completely wildly, and so it's definitely going to be interesting to see what exactly gets prioritized, but it's going to be really, really, it's not going to be, it's not going to surprise me any way uh, that it goes. Moving on to our AD carry meta, and this is the one that I think a lot of people have kind of been waiting to hear me talk about. And there are certain things in here that I think I agree with the general populace on, certain things that I disagree. We're going to start here with Tier 1. And Tier 1, I have six AD carries. I actually have this as one of the most diverse Tier 1s in uh, at Worlds, and uh, I think a lot of that will be explained throughout as I talk about this. But we've got some early game champs, we've got some late game champs. Currently, I have Aphelios, Misfortune, Caitlyn, Jinx, Draven, and Twitch as my tier one of 80 carries going into Worlds. Now, three early game, three late game. I think that's about where this will go. Uh, the early game champs, if you want to play around early game, you know, push your lead early. Try to uh, absorb a lot of pressure. You know, have your jungler come bot and play around dragons and try to dive and wh whatever, blah, blah, blah. Misfortune, Caitlyn are going to be great for that. That's exactly what happened in spring. We could very much be seeing a repeat of that at Worlds, but let's not forget about Draven. Draven is still incredibly good at snowballing the game out of control, and honestly has a pretty decent matchup into both Misfortune and Caitlyn. I could see Draven actually being a really sneakily great pick at Worlds, although I could definitely see it as something that is pretty much perma-banned by a lot of teams if they are afraid of it. But even if you don't want to go early game, you've got Aphelios, you've got Jinx, you've got Twitch, you've got these hyper carries that can still do a lot of damage in the late game, and honestly, if I had to pick, I think Aphelios is probably going to be the highest pick ban percentage at Worlds for AD carries. I just think he offers you so much. He's very safe in the early game. He gives you flexibility with what kind of support and jungle you want to play. You don't really have to invest in him early in order for him to create a lot of pressure on the map. He's pretty much always going to be useful in the late game, and a ton of people have experience playing a ton of Aphelios, and so I honestly expect Aphelios to be the top ADC in the meta. I don't know if that will come to pass, but I think he's really, really good right now, and I would be surprised if we didn't see a good amount of him at Worlds, especially with Zeri and Sivert kind of, you know, lower on the totem pole. But if we're not seeing Aphelios, we're probably going to see the Misfortune Caitlyn meta that we saw in Spring. Nobody really wants to see that, but it is definitely a possibility. Both of these champions getting buffed right before Worlds is definitely something. Misfortune, I think, is going to be more of a problem than someone like Caitlyn. Misfortune, I think, is actually really, really strong right now. Caitlyn, I think, is really annoying in laning phase, but you do have counters to that. I think if you do pick something like the Draven, you can really punish it. Or if you pick the Aphelios, the Jinx, I really do think you can just outlast it. The Caitlyn Lux really isn't going to be all that scary for you in that respect. And so, overall, uh, I really think it's going to be up to how you want to play the game. I didn't even really talk about Twitch. Twitch is in the literal exact same boat that he's been in all year. He was picked a lot in summer, got no picks in playoffs in pretty much any major region. Not too sure why that is case, but I would still expect him to be relatively vol you know, viable. Um, he didn't have a great matchup into Zeri Saber, and so I kind of understand that, but he should be much more viable in the meta right now if you do want to hyper carry. Aphelios, Jinx, Twitch, all good if you want an early game focused champion that you can play around with your jungle. Misfortune, Caitlyn, Draven, probably good, but there are tier 2 AD carries, and this is going to make some people definitely mad. The tier 2 AD carries that I have listed here, I still have Zeri and Saber on this list, which is super surprising. I've got Kalista, I've got Seraphine, and I've got Lucian. All of these champions that we've seen throughout the year that I think are all still relatively viable. Now, a lot of people are going to say that Zeri is completely out of the meta, or that Sivir is completely out of the meta. I just, I need to see it to believe it. They were the cornerstone of this meta all year long, and while, yes, especially Zeri was pretty heavily nerfed on the past few patches, I still think that a lot of the things that they do, they can still do. They're just not going to do them at the highest possible level. If we see a ton of Zeri Sivir at Worlds, you're not going to see me be all that surprised, and so... I have them here in Tier 2. There's a chance that both of them are still in Tier 1 in terms of how they're played. I really can't predict that. Same thing with Kalista. Even though she did get nerfed, it was a base health nerf. I do think it impacts her trading early, but it really doesn't impact her all that much, especially if your support is good, which oftentimes at Worlds, your support is good. I think Kalista often relied a lot on her support anyways to be able to generate a lot of leads for her. And I think it's going to be the same. She still is going to be able to capitalize on a lot of the advantages that aggressive early game supports are going to be able to create. Really, I don't think her play style changes all that much, and I still think we'll see a bit of her at Worlds. And then for Seraphine, uh, I don't know. We'll see. I think Seraphine's a good pick, but people just don't want to play her, and I get it. Like, you don't want to play Mage's bot. It's kind of boring, but Seraphine is certainly the best of that bunch right now, and I certainly think she can get some play. As this late game team fighter, the ultimate's always great. She offers you so much and offers your team generally so, so, so much overall that... 
I think she's a ton of value as an AD carry, but teams really haven't been prepping to play it, and so I don't know if we'll see it at Worlds. I just think we probably should see it at Worlds, and so that's why it's here. And then I still have Lucian on this list. Overall, Lucian, I think, is still very much pickable. Like I said, if you are going into something like the Aphelios, like the Twitch, like the Jinx, I still think Lucian can do a lot of the things that he wants to do. I just don't know if he's as blind pickable as he used to be, Lucian Nami. Definitely not the lane that it was last year at Worlds, but we've seen so many teams put in so many hours on those two champions. I would be very, very, very surprised to not see either of them at the World Championships, but... Those are my thoughts on the meta. I really do think it'll change a bit, but overall, I actually think the ADC meta is pretty open right now, and it's really just going to be up to what you and your team have practiced the most of and what you and your team feel most confident and comfortable on. If you want to play early game, you can. If you want to play late game, you can. It's really just about what you want to do here. That's going to bring us to our fifth and final role that we're going to talk about here in this video. And of course, that is the support role. And kicking off tier one of the support role, we only have three champions in this. Again, just like in the mid lane, my three champions in the support role here in tier one are Lulu, Yumi, and Nautilus. And some people are going to groan. Some people are going to be so upset by this. But it really is the truth. I still think these are the three champions that we're going to be seeing the most out of the support position. If you want enchanters, Lulu and Yumi still do that role the best, especially Yumi. Yumi is such a problem in the meta right now. She creates so many issues for pretty much everybody. Her healing is so consistent. She's so rarely in danger. She can mitigate damage not only with her heal, but by blocking and essentially getting free health for your AD carry. Her damage got increased on her Q. Her R cooldown is now shorter. There are just so many benefits to Yumi. Even if the heal is on a bigger cooldown and the movement speed isn't as much, it's still an incredibly valuable ability to have. And I still think Yumi is clear-cut the best support in the meta right now. Lulu is really not all that far behind. If you want enchanters, these are the two that you're still going to go to. I really don't think it's going to change all that much. We could see some enchanters, I guess, squeak into this tier 1. If any, it's probably going to be something like a Soraka but even then, I really just have tons of doubts that a Soraka is going to be picked nearly as much as the Lulu and the Yumi. Throughout the course of the year, teams clearly favored these two skill sets over the others. And I don't think the nerfs were enough to make their skill sets less valuable overall. And so if teams still value their skill sets, I imagine they will still value them at Worlds. Uh, if you want an engaged support, Nautilus has been the way to go the entire year. He does pretty well into Enchanters. He's really, really tanky. He's really not all that risky either, which is really, really good. So if you do want to go for that engager, Nautilus has clearly been the option. We've seen a lot of teams actually banning out Nautilus over the course of the playoffs. I would expect something like that to continue potentially if teams just don't want to have to deal with it. If they would rather take the Enchanter trade here, I would expect Nautilus to be a pretty high prio ban for a lot of teams at Worlds, but if you do want an engager, Nautilus has pretty much proven at this point to be the number one engager in the meta. And so, Lulu, Yumi, Nautilus, I know people are going to be upset by that, but to me, they are still head and shoulders above the three best supports in the meta. But I do have a much more diverse tier two. Now, it's not as diverse as mid lane, but definitely options here. We've got a couple of enchanters. We've, st we've still got an engager. There's still options here, even some that I didn't list here, but... We've got Janna, we've got Soraka, Amumu, we've got Nami, we've got Lux. All good options here, and all for different reasons. Janna and Soraka, obviously, kind of enchanters that could find their way into the meta, what with the top enchanters both receiving big nerfs on this patch. I still, like I said, think that Lulu and Yumi are going to be higher prio, but if teams are scared to go to them after the nerfs, or maybe they just don't like the state that they're in, Janna and Soraka are probably the most likely enchanters to be able to take that role from those two at the top. Both do really good things. We saw Soraka kind of break out in playoffs, both in NA and EU. I would expect that to continue here. I've been hyping up both of these champions all year long. Worlds might be the time for that hype to come to fruition. If you want an engager, it really is just a Mumu. Um, obviously, you can go for things like the Tom Kench. I definitely still think that's an option. Leona, I guess, is on the table, but I don't think Leona is all that good right now. It's really going to be a Mumu as your secondary option. We've seen a lot of a Mumu, especially with Kalista, to be able to create those early plays. If we wanted to see other things, though, uh, I'm just not sure en engagers are really the way to go. I think enchanters really just make a lot of the AD carries jobs a lot easier right now. And then, if you want your more specific lane matchups here for support, you've got your Lux that's going to be paired up with Caitlyn. If Caitlyn gets picked a lot, so is Lux. You've got your Nami. We're still going to be seeing some Lucian Nami at Worlds. Both of these picks are going to be seen, but I don't think they themselves are necessarily the power points for the meta. I think a lot of it is just the synergy that they're able to create with some strong AD carries that I would expect to see at Worlds. And so overall, I do think the support meta is pretty unchanged. I think the meta in general is pretty unchanged, but... 
I, I think people are going to be a little bit disappointed when they figure out that Lulu, Yumi, Nautilus, they're still the cream of the crop. We could, like I said, see some Janna Soraka if teams don't want to go to that Lulu, Yumi, or if they're banned out. If you want to go for an engager and you're, there's no Nautilus, Amumu's probably top prio, but you could still go something like a Tom Kench. I still think that's definitely viable. And then things like Lux, things like Nami are going to get pulled out just because of the synergy that they're able to complete with a lot of the other meta AD carries. So... Overall, a lot of good supports, a lot of options, but maybe not nearly as much as some other roles at this tournament. All right, well, that is going to do it for my 2022 World Meta Report. It's the first time for me doing a video like this. If you guys enjoyed it, uh, leave a like. Let me know that you enjoy this type of content. I'll definitely be considering it for future years if you guys enjoy it. It's definitely a little bit of a risk on this channel, but we've got so much time before Worlds that I figured I'd take a chance on this. So if you do enjoy it, leave a like. Let me know down in the comment section below if you agree, disagree with a lot of my takes. Obviously, I'm just one man's opinion. There are plenty of great videos out there and great opinions out there. If you have other takes, I'd love to hear them down in the comment section below. And of course, if you are excited for the world's content that's going to be coming out throughout the tournament, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit the bell. It's going to notify you every single time I put out a video. We've got a ton of good stuff coming up. We've got my top 20 list for the top 20 players at Worlds coming out in the next couple of days. Be excited for that. And then throughout the World Championship, I'm going to be posting daily coverage of all of the games that are going to be happening at the tournament. If you want to see my coverage of all of that, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell. You guys know it really does mean a lot to the channel. But with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all later.